Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin today's webinar, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices located in Toronto are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. My name is Carrie Grady Vincent. I'm the Senior Manager of Clinical and Scientific Programs here at Osteoporosis Canada, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you to our webinar partner, thinkbeef.ca. This presentation will provide general information about nutrition, bone health, and osteoporosis. It is not intended as individualized health advice. If you have questions about nutrition, bone health, or osteoporosis, please co consult a physician or a registered dietitian. Please note, during the webinar, if you have any questions, you can enter them by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar within the time available. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the OC Replay webpage within 24 to 48 hours. Today's webinar, Protein and Bone Health, features Dr. Deborah Butt and registered dietitian Shelley Hagen. Dr. Deborah Butt is an associate professor and clinical scientist in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Butt works as a family physician at a community-based practice in Scarborough, Ontario, and is a member of, of the Osteoporosis Canada Scientific Advisory Council and the Canadian Practice Guidelines Working Group for exercises in individuals at risk of fracture. Her published work includes several validation studies for various medical conditions, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses in individuals at risk of fracture. And her research skills include conducting randomized clinical trials, as well as research methods using large healthcare administrative databases and family physicians' electronic medical records. Our second speaker is Shelley Hagen. She is a registered dietitian and currently works as an educator in the Women's Wellness Program at the Gray Nuns Community Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, facilitating menopause and osteoporosis group education sessions and working one-on-one -on -one with patients to make well-informed health decisions concerning menopause and osteoporosis management. Shelley completed her Bachelor of Science in Foods and Nutrition at the University of Saskatchewan. Shelley is credentialed as an NAMS certified menopause practitioner through the North American Menopause Society and is also a member of, of Osteoporosis Canada's Scientific Advisory Council. So now it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Deborah Butt. So Deborah, please take it away. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say hello from Toronto um, and just uh, allow you to see me. Um, during the presentation, I'm just going to turn the video off so we can focus on this presentation. So welcome to this interesting topic. So I'm pleased to be working with Shelley to present uh, um, the information on protein and bone health. Next slide. So today we're gonna to discuss the essential role of protein in our diet and be able to differentiate between types of protein sources, namely the types of animal sources versus plant sources. We'll look at the role of protein in bone health and dispel some of the myths versus facts about dietary protein because I'm sure you've heard a number of different things about protein in our diet. Next slide, please. So osteoporosis is a public health problem. Osteoporosis is a disease characterized by progressive loss of bone mass and quality. 
Osteoporosis is the cause of many fractures among adults aged 40 years and older. In fact, in 2016, about 2.2 million, 12% of Canadians aged 40 years and older were diagnosed with osteoporosis, the majority of which were women, 80%. The residual lifetime risk of developing any fracture beyond age 60 is estimated to be 44% for women and 25% for men. Next slide, please. Osteoporosis has a significant impact on health. Fractures secondary to osteoporosis are associated with high rates of death, particularly hip fractures. There is a rising prevalence of osteoporosis, leading to an increase in the number of fractures, resulting in hospitalization and increasing the economic burden on society. There are also substantial healthcare costs as a result of osteoporosis and related fractures from morbidity due to chronic pain, impaired mobility, loss of independence, and poor quality of life related to fractures. In today's session, we will be discussing the role of protein in supporting good bone health and decreasing your risk of osteoporosis. Next slide, please. So there are many things that impact on bone health. Next, yes, hormones. Next, please, nutrition. Next, mechanical factors, such as physical activity and its impact on bone shape and composition of bone. And let's not forget genetics. Next slide, please. I just wanna remind the audience of two key vitamins that play a role in osteoporosis. Osteoporosis Canada recommends calcium and vitamin D. For those aged 19 to 50 years of age, your daily calcium requirement, including what you derive from diet and supplements, should be 1,000 milligrams per day. We generally recommend that you try to obtain as much as your calcium from diet. The daily vitamin D intake for the same age group should be between 400 to 1,000 international units per day, recognizing that certain populations may need higher amounts, such as pregnant or breastfeeding women. For those aged 50 years of age and older, the daily calcium requirement should be 1200 milligrams per day and the daily vitamin D requirement between 800 to 2000 international units per day. And again, this can vary in this population depending on your underlying medical condition. Next slide, please. So what is a protein? Now, and a protein is an essential macronutrient for the body. And it's made from 20 plus basic building blocks called amino acids. Now our bodies can make amino acids either from scratch or by modifying existing amino acids in the body. There are nine amino acids known as the essential amino acids. And these essential amino acids must come from food. Protein is a key building block for our body, and it can be found in muscle, bone, skin, hair, and most body parts or tissues. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there are the nine essential amino acids, which are listed on the right. Histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. And these are the amino acids that we must obtain from food. Then there are the 11 non-essential amino acids, which are listed on the left, such as alanine, arginine, asparagine, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamic acid, glutamine, lysine, proline, serine, and tyrosine. And these are the ones that our bodies contain and use. Next slide. So the sources of protein. 
Well, protein is present in both animal, beef, pork, chicken, fish, dairy, and plant sources such as legumes, beans, nuts, seeds, tofu, and some fortified beverages. In terms of animal-based sources, they tend to contain higher quantities of more balanced proportions of amino acids relative to human tissues than plant-based sources. Now, some plant-based sources such as legumes do contain considerable amounts of protein. However, comparatively few provide enough of all the essential nine amino acids. So for those who choose to have a plant-based source of protein, you would probably need to eat a variety of different plant-based sources to obtain the required daily intake of the essential amino acids. Next slide, please. So just to highlight the, sor the sources of protein further, out of the full range of 20 amino acids or the building blocks of protein, there are nine essential amino acids that need to be consumed in your diet. The other 11 amino acids can almost always be made within your bodies, except um, uh, depending on certain medical conditions that might um, prevent that, which are rare. Now meat, beef, poultry, pork, fish, milk, and eggs are all examples of complete proteins because they have all nine essential amino acids in large quantities. Now our bodies can utilize these proteins to the fullest and their essential amino acids can be used to repair tissue, form hormones, enzymes, and neurotransmitters, which are important for brain function among performing other bodily functions. Next slide. Now there are many plant-based eaters in the world that don't have such wide accessibility to complete protein sources and amino acids. There are a few vegetarian sources that contain all nine essential amino acids, including eggs and dairy for those lacto-ovo vegetarians, as well as quinoa, buckwheat, hep seeds, chia seeds. So the, the point is here, although plant proteins form a large part of the human diet, most are deficient in one or more essential amino acids and are therefore regarded as incomplete proteins. Next slide, please. So protein and the musculoskeletal system. We know that bone is made up of calcium, other minerals, and protein. Protein makes up about 50% of bone volume and about one third of its bone mass. Protein provides the structural matrix of bone, whereas calcium is the dominant mineral within that matrix. So adequate dietary protein intake is essential for optimal growth and maintenance of the structure and function of many organs, especially the musculoskeletal system. Next slide, please. And let's not forget muscles. Protein gives bone its strength and flexibility and is also a big component of muscles, which are important for mobility and in preventing falls. Next slide, please. So there is a term called the recommended dietary allowance, RDA, for protein intake. And this for a healthy adult is 0.8 grams per kilograms per day. And what that means is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is defined as the required minimum amount of dietary protein required to meet the amino acid requirements and prevent loss of muscle mass. Next slide, please. It's also important that we touch base on protein and bone health in the elderly. Older adults may become low in protein because they may not eat enough protein or they or their body has a decreased ability to use the protein that is already there. Unintentional weight loss and muscle loss in the elderly can put these individuals at risk for developing other disease 
or death. Next slide, please. So now I want to present a few slides on myth versus fact on protein and bone health, as I'm sure the audience has heard a number of things about protein and how it relates to bone health. So this first statement, higher protein intakes above the recommend required dietary allowance, particularly of animal origin, is associated with adverse effects on bone due to too much amino acids in the body, resulting in greater loss of calcium in the urine from the skeleton. Next. So for several years in the medical literature, this was an area of great debate for years called the acid ash hypothesis. The bottom line is this. Next. This statement is false. We do not have the evidence to support. We have found that higher protein intakes, particularly of animal or origin, do have beneficial effects on bone health. Next slide, please. Another thing, statement, myth versus fact on protein and bone health. Plant-based proteins are more beneficial than animal-based proteins in improving bone health such as bone mineral density. Next. So current evidence does not support plant-based proteins being more advantageous or, ad, ad, or, or, or better than animal-based proteins on bone health. Studies are still limited in this area. So the conclusion to this statement is, next, false. There is no difference in the medical literature between plant-based proteins or animal-based proteins in improving bone health, although studies are still uh, being investigated. Next slide. So I just wanted to have a slide on the current evidence for protein in bone health. This is certainly a growing field with new evidence emerging. The reality is that in primary care medicine, where I practice as a family physician, there's very little information to guide individuals with osteoporosis on the role of protein in bone health. And that might be why this has not really been a discussion point when you visit your family doctor's office, because there are a number of risk factors that we know a lot more about. So this information has been lacking. The good news is that Osteoporosis Canada has a working group on nutrition that will soon be publishing guidelines on this topic. So stay tuned. Now I want to turn over the second half of the presentation to my colleague, Shelley Hagen, who will be providing in-depth information on the protein content of different protein sources, as well as protein supplements. So stay tuned for the exciting second half. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for everyone for uh, attending so far. Thank you, Dr. Butt. And uh, I'll just briefly put my uh, image on so you can see who's speaking in the background, but then I want you to focus on the slides. So I'm going to stop my video for now. So good afternoon and thanks to Osteoporosis Canada and their sponsors for organizing this webinar and inviting me to be part of it. Dr. Butt has done a wonderful job of helping us understand what protein is, types of protein, and the role of protein in strengthening our bones and our muscles to help reduce our risk of osteoporosis and related fractures. I am going to dig a little bit deeper and focus more on the specific protein requirements and, and provide you with some tools to help assess if you are meeting your protein needs. And I will... Um, finish off by sharing some tips and tricks to help increase the protein content of your diet. And then we will uh, field some questions. So as um, Dr. Butt said, uh, protein is a, a, a major ingredient in the structure of the bone. It forms the matrix. And then that matrix is um, hardened with other minerals like calcium and magnesium and phosphorus that helps bone um, be, uh, 
be strong and uh, resist fractures. So it is an uh, important element. Uh, however, it's important to understand that protein is just one nutrient that import, impacts bone health. And the, to get the full benefits of protein, you need to look at the whole diet. And if you just put all your attention on getting adequate protein at the expense of other um, nutrients, uh, such as low calcium and vitamin D, then you're not going to get the full effects of the, the protein. So bone is complicated. It's a very complicated dynamic structure, and it depends on a whole variety of nutrients, including protein. Now, with that a bit of a um, uh, caveat, I do want to touch base a little, uh, touch base briefly on how much calcium. And again, Dr. Butt set this up very, very nicely and provided an overview of the calcium requirements. And so, for most adults over 50, age 50, we're looking at, at needing 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day. And so, a good uh, thing to sort of think about once in a while is to do a quick assessment and and sort of uh, see how much calcium you are getting from your diet on a regular basis. And if you like, uh, if you regularly include uh, dairy products such as cheese, milk, and yogurt or if you are trying to um, partake in some of the, the non-dairy alternatives, those are good calcium sources and can um, add up quickly. And there is some great tools to help you assess your calcium, uh, the calcium content of your diet. Uh, if you visit osteoporosiscanada.ca uh, and, and check out their calcium calculator, that's a really marvelous tool to help you uh, assess the calcium that you're getting from your diet. You also need to think about other calcium sources. So are you taking a multivitamin? Most multivitamins contain some calcium or are you taking calcium supplements in other forms? And you need to sort of get a sense of how much calcium is coming from these sources. Because at the end of the day, the bottom line is you want to um, look at the amount of calcium from your diet and the calcium in your supplements. And together, these two um, sources should equal about 1200 milligrams a day. There's no benefit to superloading the system with calcium. Um, your body just really isn't able to use it once your levels reach more than 1200 milligrams a day. And so for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to assume that you are optimizing your calcium intake. And the same thing in terms of vitamin D intake, um, it's really important and you want to make sure that you are meeting the recommended amounts. Vitamin D comes from uh, three primary sources. So one is sunlight exposure. So when the sun, certain uh, rays from the sun hit the skin, it activates a process to make vitamin D in your in your body, but do remember we live in the northern part of the world, so we don't get that effect for several months of the year. And in the summertime, we're often working indoors. And so it can be tough to rely on the sun to get adequate vitamin D. In front of you is a list of the vitamin D content of various foods. You can see it's a very short list. So unless you tend to eat fish a couple times a week, uh, especially cold water fish, um, it can be a challenge to meet your vitamin D requirements with sun or with food. And so for this reason, Osteoporosis Canada recommends that all adults consider taking a vitamin D supplement year round. And usually we specify in the form of vitamin D3. So again, let's turn our attention back to protein with the full understanding that you've optimized your calcium and vitamin D intakes. So just to uh, recap, uh, on the sources of protein that were outlined by uh, Dr. Butt. So certainly we get protein from all kinds of meats, beef, pork, um, game, fish, poultry, milk, eggs, cheese, yogurt. So your dairy products are rich protein sources and those are complete proteins. Um, the uh, we also get protein from dried or canned peas, beans, or lentils, which are collectively known as legumes, from nuts and seeds and nut butters, which are very popular these days. Soy products give you uh, to um, protein as well. So if you are eating things like tofu or drinking soy beverages, there are some meat alternatives that are appearing in the marketplace. These are usually made from pea protein and other ingredients um, brown rice protein and things like that to um, 
uh, provide some protein and very small amounts are found in most foods we eat, such as grains, vegetables, and fruits. So there are a lot of protein sources. In terms of sort of the actual protein content of various foods, this is a list that is looking at um, um, sort of a portion size and then specifies the protein content in grams. So if you have a cook, any type of cooked meat, fish, poultry, or wild game, and you have about a two and a half ounce portion, which is a piece of meat that would fit nicely into the palm of your hand, a small uh, chicken thigh, a small hamburger patty, that would give you about 21 grams of protein. Three quarters of a cup of firm tofu would give you about 12 grams of protein. An egg gives you about six grams. 50 grams of cheese, which is a fairly generous portion of cheese, sort of roughly equivalent in, in size to the, um, the size of two nine volt batteries. That would give you about 12 grams of cheese. Half a cup of cottage cheese is about 13 grams of protein. Uh, one cup of fortified soy beverage uh, gives you about seven to eight grams, whereas cow's milk gives you about nine grams of protein in the same serving. And three quarters of a cup of legumes is about 12 grams. Three quarters of a cup of regular yogurt gives you about seven grams of protein in that serving. Whereas if you choose a Greek style yogurt that has a bit more protein, that can be up to about 14 grams of protein. And peanut butter, nuts and seeds, two tablespoons give you about four grams. And a slice of bread gives you about four grams. Cold cereals give you some protein, about 30 grams. So it'll depend if you choose a light puffy cereal and how much volume that is versus a heavier cereal. Cooked hot cereals, three quarters of a cup are about four grams, half a cup of rice or pasta, so about three grams. Quinoa, which Dr. Butt mentioned earlier, is about four grams per half cup portion. And most vegetables, average serving, give you about two grams and fruit about one gram. So you can see it is really concentrated in the, um, um, the meat and dairy um, uh, sections and uh, some of your cooked legumes. So you're not always going to have a list of, of foods and with the protein content in your back pocket, but that's where you can, um, when you are out shopping and sort of uh, in the grocery store, you can check out the nutrition facts um, table that is found on most grocery products or most products that are available in the grocery stores in Canada. So all um, foods have to have the nutrition facts table with the exception of you won't find it on fresh fruits and vegetables or fresh meat, fish or poultry products. But what you wanna look for if you're sort of um, looking at the protein information is first of all, you have to take into account the serving size. So for this um, image here, we're looking at the nutrition facts for turkey sausage. And if you had three of the sausages, you would get about 12 grams of protein. Um, I know that when I eat these sausages, I tend to just have two of them. So that would give me about eight grams of protein. So if you were sort of keeping track of how much protein you're getting throughout the day, sort of you know once in a while doing a little check and see how many grams of protein, the nutrition facts table comes in very handy to help you keep track of that. Um, and uh, you can monitor that. So again, how much protein is recommended? Well, the, uh, as, uh, the current recommended dietary allowance for most healthy um, adults is set at 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. There is a little bit of um, research happening and, and some proposals and nothing is written in stone, nothing has been formally accepted that perhaps as we get older, we should actually um, maybe be increasing these recommendations so that we are striving to get 1.0 to 1.2 grams of protein, especially in the older population if they're quite underweight or quite malnour malnourished, or perhaps even after if you have fallen and broken a bone and had a fracture, that maybe we should be working towards the higher protein intakes. Um, so that's to be determined and uh, watch out for the, the information as it is um, evolving and, and changing. So what does this really mean? 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. 
Well, we, if we want to sort of get a working number, it's a good idea if you have your calculator, and all of us have smartphones these days, which have a calculator function. And so what you really need to start with is by um, looking at your body weight. So let's pick an example here for an adult female who weighs 65 kilograms or 143 pounds. And then you just use your calculator to do the math. So 65 kilograms times 0 0.8, and that works out that she would need about 52 grams of protein a day. If we look at a male counterpart who weighs a little bit more, weighs in at 80 kilograms or 176 pounds, 80 times 0 0.8 means that they would need about 64 grams of protein per day. And if these individuals happen to be older, um, then we can look at what do, what do the sort of newer got, what do the, the proposed recommendations sort of mean from a, uh, how much protein? And so the, the female who weighed 65 kilograms, instead of needing 52 grams of protein a day, it would increase to 65 to 78. And for the man would be about 80 to 96 grams a day. So it's not a huge, huge increase, but it still, still does take some planning to make sure that you are meeting those, um, that amount of protein on a regular basis. And again, the, the guidelines that I'm showing you, these do not apply to children, pregnant or breastfeeding women or some elite athletes. So um, keep in mind that I'm talking about uh, protein recommendations for the average healthy um, individual adults. So where do, where do Canadians get their protein? What are their main sources? And there was a fairly major survey done in 2015 called the Canadian Community Health Survey that showed that two thirds of Canadian adults um, or that animal foods um, provides the most protein for two thirds of Canadian adults. So 22% of our protein comes from uh, red and processed meats, 20% from poultry and eggs, 20% from grains, cereals, and breads, 17% from dairy, 5% from nuts, seeds, and legumes, 5% from vegetables and fruit, 5% from fish and shellfish, and 6% from other miscellaneous sources. On the right side of your screen, it, it uh, is a little bit of a graph that, that shows us how are we doing? Are we meeting our protein, uh, meeting the protein recommendations on a general basis? And the good news is, with very few exceptions, most Canadians meet or exceed the protein recommendations. Where we start to see a little bit of um, um, variance to that is if you look at the, towards the bottom of the screen and look at the yellow bar, which represents women, blue is for the men, and you look at sort of the, the women age 51 to 70, you can see there of almost 6% of them are not meeting the, the uh, daily protein recommendations. And that number certainly goes up uh, as they move into their 70s, closer to 10% are not meeting their protein requirements. And for men, there's a little bit of change there, but not as dramatic. So women really do need to be conscious of their protein intake, especially as they get older. So in the osteoporosis clinic, I often uh, check in with patients and sort of ask them about uh, sort of their general eating plan. And it's not uncommon that they'll tell me for breakfast, they have two pieces of toast with butter or jam, some coffee with cream, for lunch, they're often having a, a canned soup, like a vegetable beef soup, some crackers, and usually some vegetables in season, and maybe a cup of tea with that. And supper is often a more substantial meal. It's a family meal, and they'll have some type of cooked meat, usually a starchy item, a cooked vegetable, and maybe a little bit of ice cream for dessert. And if we add all the, the protein up in, in, uh, that this person is consuming throughout the day, it adds up to about 48 grams, which is slightly less than what was needed for that woman who weighed 65 pounds and certainly suboptimal for the, the man who needed a bit more. So what could we do to sort of improve that? Well, we really need to think about adding a protein-rich food at each major meal. So for instance, 
Um, we're starting off with our toast here, but maybe we want to put an, um, a nut butter over top of it, peanut butter or almond butter or things like that. And adding in a small serving of yogurt raises that protein content of that meal to 16 grams. For lunch, um, uh, choosing a soup, uh, this is more or less the same kind of soup, uh, same protein content, different type of soup, um, having the crackers, but this time adding in a small serving of cheese, um, and uh, that substantially adds the uh, protein there. And instead of the tea, they're having some fortified oat beverage. So now the protein content is raised to 23 grams in that meal. And for dinner, more or less the same uh, type of dinner, uh, ground beef patty, um, some cooked pasta, a bun, and some cooked vegetables. And the protein in that meal is about 38 grams. So the main change was adding in the protein rich foods uh, throughout the day and consciously um, having them at breakfast or lunch. So the total daily intake of protein with this second eating plan is certainly much closer to the uh, recommendations that we talked about earlier. So in terms of making healthy protein food choices, it's important to think about including a protein rich food at each major meal in terms of sort of a visual clue, aim, aim that one quarter of your plate is covered in, in foods, uh, in protein rich foods. And it's really important to enjoy a variety of protein foods. So not just eating the same two protein foods over all the time, but diversity, variety is the healthiest thing that you can do. And to really choose a balance of animal and, and plant-based protein foods where possible. I also mentioned the importance of, uh, I, I mentioned the importance of sort of including um, protein throughout the day. So it, it seems that the one of the real ways that you can meet your daily protein requirements is if you are having protein at breakfast, lunch, and supper. If you just try to do it in one meal, it can be tough to meet your daily requirements. But if you're spreading it throughout the day, that's really important and aiming to include 20 to 25 grams at each major meal. And there is a little bit of emerging evidence to show that that's important to consume protein before or just after a fairly intense bout of exercise or workout. And then you've got the protein on board to help repair the little tears in the muscle tissue that may help with that exercise. So uh, distributing protein throughout the day and around the time of, of your physical activity seems to be really important. So just uh, wanting to wrap up and give you a few tips for adding protein to your diet. So something that works really well in our house is at uh, um, skim milk powder or powdered milk. I, um, I have a 16 year old who's not a big uh, fan of, of uh, uh, milk and things like that. So I started adding skim milk powder to try to increase the calcium content. Um, so I mix it in with um, hot cereals. If I'm mashing potatoes, certain cream soup recipes, sauces, can add it into scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. If I'm mixing up meatloaf, I add a few tablespoons of um, uh, powdered milk to it, and no one knows it's there but me. So initially, I started out to try to increase the calcium density of our of our diet, but it's also a great way to sneak in extra protein. You could also add skim milk powder to smoothies and things like that, which are very popular these days. Cheese is a great protein source and goes well on so many things. So you can, you know, sort of think of ways of um, adding it. It can be melted on hamburgers, add it to vegetables, melted on tortillas, add it to scrambled eggs, soup, sauces, mashed potatoes, and great flavor profile. Uh, cheese is also a great snack with fruit or crackers and is great at it uh, when you grate it and add it to salads. Um, small amounts of cooked meats can be added to soups, omelets, casseroles. They make great uh, cracker toppings. So earlier we had looked at that one meal plan where it showed the canned uh, vegetable soup with beef. And realistically, there's only like two pieces of beef in there. But if you had some leftover uh, meat from the night before, you could chop that up and fortify your soup and sneak in a little bit of protein that way. 
sometimes as we get older, it's harder, our, our teeth um, uh, don't work as well, or we have poor fitting dentures and it's hard to chew um, cooked meats. And that's where your chopped or ground meat um, um, products work really well and can help keep the protein intake up. Eggs are fantastic. So don't forget about having French toast um, at your weekend brunch, throwing in an extra egg to your pancake batter, chopped boils, boiled eggs make great salad toppers. And nut butters are very popular and can be spread on toast, part of sandwiches or crackers. You can blend them into uh, milkshakes. You can swirl them into hot cereals and things like that and are great as a dip or, or served with uh, fruit or vegetables. So some in, um, interesting ways to add protein to your diet. And you perhaps have come up with some great things that you can share with us in the chat as well. So what about protein supplements? So if you go to the grocery store, there's a whole aisle of products, protein powders, protein bars, and things like that. And these are, are powdered forms of protein that come usually from plant sources, such as soybeans, peas, rice, potatoes, or hemp, or they could come from eggs or milk in the form of casein or whey. And they usually are packaged with other ingredients such as sweeteners or thickeners or vitamins and minerals. Are they helpful? Are they necessary? Well, they're hugely popular, but as I said, most of us are meeting our, our, our vitamin, our protein requirements with just regular foods. So we really don't need to spend a lot of money or fortify our diet with these protein supplements. And it's just not going to offer a, a lot of benefit. So leave those behind, focus more on, on your diet and try to make protein rich foods your first choice and a variety of food of protein sources to really meet your daily protein uh, requirements. And so Dr. Butt uh, sort of mentioned on this, this concern, sometimes I'm asked, well, too much of protein is a bad thing. And, and she clearly showed you that there, it, it, uh, it's very, it's highly unlikely that we are getting too much dietary protein. There may be, you know, one or two population groups that are sort of overdoing, uh, over, one or two subsections of the population that are overdoing it. But realistically, especially as we get older, there's much more of a concern that we're not meeting our protein uh, requirements. So sometimes things get, um, the message gets confusing and people hear, well, this isn't so good and I'll stop doing it. But realistically, it is important to pay attention to protein all throughout our lives. And especially as we get older, for a whole variety of reasons, in, in, um, including protecting our bones and reducing our fracture risk. So still have questions. There's lots of information out there. Osteoporosis Canada is a great source. Dietitians of Canada has an active website, as does Health Canada. And uh, you can always ask, uh, you can always connect and speak directly with the registered dietitian. Or if you are concerned about your protein intake, you can ask your family doctor for a referral and do a one on one consult and uh, complete nutrition assessment with a registered dietitian. So I'm going to uh, stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to Carrie, who will moderate the question and answer section. Well, thank you, Shelley and Dr. Butt. That has been wonderful. Lots of great information for our listeners. So now we have quite a few questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, first question, I'm going to throw it out to Shelley. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. You touched on, on it a little bit, but could you uh, give us a bit of detail about what options for protein there, there's available for vegans? Well, it, uh, it's a little bit more challenging for vegans to meet their protein requirement. And, uh, you know, if, it's, uh, if, if they're conscious and carefully planning things, uh, then um, uh, they can easily meet their requirements. The difficulty is, is sometimes people say almost overnight, I'm going to stop eating this whole food group. I'm going to stop eating meat. I'm going to stop eating animal-based products. And they give very little thought to sort of what 
large group of nutrients was provided in that food group and how to replace them. So if, if you're sort of approaching this more thoughtfully and, and choosing not to include animal-based sources of protein, but planning it out so you can see there's a whole bunch of plant proteins. And if you're eating a variety of them, you can meet their needs. But it really is a commitment to having, you know, legumes, um, cooked legumes at each of the major meals and other sources it takes a little bit of work and planning. There's lots of resources out there that can help you, but you just don't want to make a, a really dramatic change without sort of looking at, without planning it out and replacing that important group of nutrients. Okay, thanks Shelley. I now have a question for Dr. Bat. How does age and menopause factor into the ability to digest protein effectively so that it helps bones? Well, thank you for the question. So um, at, when a patient presents with uh, concerns about the risk of having a fracture secondary to osteoporosis, what we try to do um, as healthcare professionals is to consider what can we modify in terms of factors that can increase the risk of having a fracture. Now, we know that as you age, that you have the natural aging process whereby you can lose some bone mass called osteopenia, and that your risk of having osteoporosis is higher. But we can't change that. We all have to age. We know that uh, as women, we go through a natural process called menopause. When you go through menopause at an age that's less than 45 years of age, that can be considered a secondary cause of osteoporosis. But that, again, is not something you can modify. However, having said that, it's really important to optimize your intake of protein. Now, aging and menopause, which are natural processes, should not affect your ability to digest proteins. You still, can you still continue to digest proteins. And remember that protein intake is but one small aspect of the overall factors that are involved in maintaining bone health. So you still wanna optimize your calcium and vitamin D intake. You still want to participate in exercise. You wanna work on those factors as well that help prevent fractures. And so it's the whole picture of what you need to do to do that. Does that help with that question? That was great, Deborah. Thank you. Um, I now have another question for Shelly. Shelly, um, your sample menu showed oat beverages added to lunch. Wouldn't soy beverage provide more protein? It, it, it does. Uh, so uh, soy, soy um, beverages have more calcium, um, more protein per serving than does the oat beverage. But again, not everyone likes the flavor of the soy. So it is nice to have some product um, options on the market. But again, you just need to be aware of that difference and adjust in other ways. Um, uh, um, and, and, and that's where your labels can, can really, really help you. So if they're fortified, they would have the same calcium. The difference is just uh, some of the, the nut um, beverages, cashew, uh, rice, almond, oat, do not have as much protein as a glass of soy or a glass of cow's milk. Okay, so my message, my takeaway message from that is it's very important to read labels so that you see the amount of calcium and protein in a product. Exactly. And, and I think that's one of the brings up a really good point. Canadians on average are drinking about 20 liters of milk less um, compared to a few years ago. But again, have we thought it up, thought about that and replaced those nutrients with other foods. And so um, oftentimes we just are making changes here, but not planning and incorporating them back in in other ways. Okay. Um, Dr. Butt. I have a question for you. Um, doctors have a varying perspective on diets. Um, this reader finds it confusing and wonders, how do you know which one is the right one? 
So I'm, I'm understanding this question to mean that doctors have a varying perspective on uh, protein diets, uh, animal versus plant-based sources. Am I understanding the question? Uh, I, I think you could answer it that way. That would be fine. Okay. So as I, I kind of mentioned in my last slide, you know, we go through medical school training and we really didn't learn anything that uh, in terms of protein um, requirements. This is all relatively new to physicians um, in our medical school training. So these are things that we learn over time. And so therefore, when you don't have guidelines or information disseminated in primary care, it's often hard as a physician to discuss um, you know, uh, how best to optimize protein in your diet. So you can understand the confusion. We want to help, but we don't have the tools quite yet to help you. And that's why we have wonderful people like Shelly that we can refer you off to to give you the education that you need. And that's also why one of the priorities in, in terms of some of the um, information that's soon going to be disseminated from Osteoporosis Canada, that they've established working groups in the area of nutrition so they can evaluate the evidence to provide guidelines and education to physicians and the public on what would be the most appropriate uh, diet in terms of protein to help patients that, um, that have osteoporosis. So the good news is the information is coming. And this is kind of a prelude to the, the next um, uh, you know, uh, 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 presentation on the state of where we are now. Great, thank you. Um, Shelley, my next question is something you, you touched on in your presentation, but I'm wondering if you could um, delve into it a little bit more. Um, any suggestions for seniors who may not have the appetite to meet their needs or may have some chewing or swallowing issues to, to meet their protein needs? So sometimes that's where some of the um, nutrition uh, drinks that are available in the market can come in. Um, or you can make your own sort of nutritional drinks fortified with the, the uh, skim milk powder or, or maybe even purchasing a product with um, purchasing a protein powder to use. And so that in the, the, the small volume of foods that that person is able to consume, you're making it more nutrient dense. So they don't have to eat more, but the, the, the portion that they are eating does contain a higher density of protein or calcium or whatever you're trying to, to achieve. But it, it is really, really a, a challenge, um, especially when you lose your appetite and um, you know, nothing looks appealing or if you, you know, have trouble with dentition and, and it's a struggle to chew things, you know, that's really where I would recommend uh, sort of working one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian and really brainstorming some good strategies to, um, to help you out and prevent any further um, decline or, or, or further loss of um, weight and muscle and things like that. Okay. Um, I have another question for Dr. Butt. Um, is medication required um, versus eating the right food and vitamin D? So I think the person is asking if you're eating a great diet, getting all your vitamins and minerals, do you still need to take any sort of uh, supplements? So I, the general um, message that we uh, try to uh, educate patients with is always try to derive as much of your vitamins, if possible, from food sources. And this may not be possible, depending on your underlying medical condition, your ability to, um, whether you have a malabsorption uh, problem, or um, it, it really depends on what your underlying condition is. But if that is not possible, then we would recommend supplements. In terms of there being a medication, there, there is not a medication that we would prescribe um, to, um, that, that's a substitute for these vitamins and these nutrients, because we have the food sources available for you to do so. Um, I, I think that sometimes the challenge is for a patients that I see is that 
how do I know that I'm taking the right amount of calcium? How do I know that I'm taking, you know, the right amount, uh, um, you know, of a nutrient? And, you, and I think as a, a general rule of thumb, we say that as long as you're not lactose intolerant, and maybe you're not really paying attention to what you're eating, your baseline, we say, is about 500 milligrams. So build from there. And it's not that hard uh, when you think of it that way. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we have time for one last question. And I'm going to throw this question to Shelly. Um, and it sort of summarizes what, what we've been talking about today. Should I focus on protein first and then calcium? Or what would you recommend? We, unfortunately, we have to do it all at once. So <laughs> if you just do the protein and the calcium and vitamin D aren't balanced with it, you're not going to get the, the, the full effects. So it's not an and or it's looking at the whole diet approach. And I know that's harder and it's, um, you know, more challenging, but the overall benefits are there for the skeleton when everything is, is um, working like it should be. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope at the end of this presentation, no one goes away with that protein is the be all and end all for bone health. It's really a, a, a whole list of nutrients and a healthy food approach that is really going to keep you on track combined with being active, stopping smoking, all those other things working together. Wow. That's, that's a lot of great information, you two. Um, that's all the time we have for questions right now. Uh, for tools and resources to help you manage your bone health, please visit osteoporosis.ca. You can use the cal Calculate Your Calcium tool, and you can listen to Unbreakable, the OC podcast. You can find episodes on the website or through your favorite podcast provider. Check out the Know Your Risk quiz, and you can also view the recorded versions of this and other webinars we have on the OC Replay webpage, which will be available in the next 24 to 48 hours. Next slide, please. Again, thank you to our webinar partner, thinkbeef.ca. And next slide, please. Thank you again to Dr. Deborah Butt and to our dietitian, Shelley Hagen. Stay connected by subscribing to the national e-newsletter, which you can do at the top of the OC website to get news, information, and notices of upcoming webinars directly to your inbox. You can also follow OC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So until next time, thank you for joining us today, and please continue to stay well and stay connected. Take care, everyone. <laughs>